Okay, we're going to continue our discussion of John Locke. Now, in order to set the stage, I want to remind you of the two theses, the two claims of representative realism. Now, first there's the causal thesis. The causal thesis says that our sense perceptions are caused by material objects. And so far, John Locke has said, yes, that's absolutely true. Our sense perceptions are caused by something outside of our minds. Now, What's left is the resemblance thesis. To what extent do our sense perceptions resemble uh, the objects that cause them? That's what Locke is going to talk about now. So, so far, uh, he's defended the causal thesis. We need to now look at the resemblance thesis. And that's what he does in this section concerning our simple ideas of sensation. First, he wants to establish some terminology. He wants to distinguish between what he calls ideas and what he calls qualities. And the basic idea here is that the idea is uh, what's in your head, the perception. And the quality is the whatever property the external object has which causes or produces the ideas in your mind. So back to our picture here, ideas are what's here in your head, qualities are whatever this object has which makes it produce that idea in you. Now, um, he wants to distinguish also between what he calls original or primary qualities and secondary qualities. And he's also got what you, what you might call tertiary qualities, a third sort. The tertiary ones aren't that important for our purposes, though. So primary qualities, he describes this way. He says, there are those pro qualities or properties that are utterly inseparable from the body, no matter what you do to it. So if you take like a grain of wheat and you, no matter what you do to it, you crush it into small pieces. However, whatever you do to it, it's always going to have some kind of shape, what he calls figure, some kind of extension. It's going to be extended in space to some degree. It's going to have some measure of solidity and it's going to either be in motion or rest. And there will be a certain number of those particles. Uh, so those are primary qualities solidity, extension, figure, motion or rest, to number. And these are things that basically geometry can study. Um, then there's secondary qualities. And secondary qualities are going to be what we think of as colors, sounds, tastes, smells, and tactile feels. Um, and what Locke is going to claim is that really what those amount to are simply uh, well, we'll see what, what those amount to in a second. So to go back to our picture here, you've got primary qualities and secondary qualities. Primary qualities, say of this red ball, would be its roundness, its oneness, and the fact that it's in rest or in motion. Um, secondary qualities are of the ball or whatever properties that this ball has that makes you have the idea of its redness or also of its the smoothness of its feel or the way it smells whatever properties of this ball impact you in such a way as to give you a sense of how it feels smells tastes or the color it has those are its secondary properties now on the idea side you've got an idea of the primary of the primary qualities of the ball say its roundness You've also got an idea of the secondary qualities of the of the ball, like say its redness. Now, its redness is that familiar sensation you have when you see something that's that's red. And Locke's real big question here is: Is there any property out here in the ball that actually resembles your idea of redness? And is there any property out here in the ball that really resembles your idea of roundness? So we'll see what he says here. Now he starts with primary qualities, and here's his uh, fundamental assumption he has. He says the only way that bodies can produce perceptions in us is by impulse. That is by things bumping into each other, impacting our eyeballs, impacting our brains, you know, like billiard balls knocking into each other, and then somehow triggering ideas in our mind. Okay, now. With that assumption, he makes an argument. He makes the following argument. He says, if we have ideas of primary qualities of distant objects, then those objects 
communicate motion to our minds through a chain of intervening bodies. That's the only way it could happen. But clearly we do have ideas of primary qualities of distant objects. So therefore, objects communicate motion to our minds through a chain of intervening bodies. So to go back to our picture here, his whole point is that the only way that a red ball over here could cause an idea in your mind here is if there was literally like a chain of things bumping into each other between the ball and your eyeball and your brain to cause this idea. That's what he's arguing. Now, you don't see anything in between here, but there's got to be something because that's the only way body, a body could affect another body. So that, that's his basic point. Now, so here's where that leaves us with the primary qualities. Um, back here, it's the primary qualities of things, their shape, their speed, their motion, that, that, that are part of this causal chain that causes your idea of their primary qualities. So there's got to be primary qualities in the ball that resemble your idea of those primary qualities. That's his, his basic claim. It's not the same story, though, when it comes to secondary qualities. And here's what he wants to say about that. If the motion of particles is what causes our ideas of secondary qualities, then our ideas of secondary qualities don't resemble their causes. And let me explain. You've got this idea of what redness is, right? But what caused your idea of redness? Well, it was particles bumping into each other between the ball and your brain. Um, it was impact, not anything that you might think of as color, which caused your idea of redness. Uh, this, or the same goes for smell. The reason you had this kind of smell is because somehow particles from this one object bumped into other particles, which bumped into your nose, and whatever nerve endings are there, and then triggered this sort of familiar sensation of smell in your mind. But the bumping particles do not resemble your sensation of smell, your idea of smell. And he says that's the only way it could happen, and therefore our ideas of secondary qualities do not resemble their causes. Now this is supposed to be a big shocking conclusion. He says, from whence I think it is easy to draw this observation, that the ideas of primary qualities of bodies are resemblances of them. And their patterns do really exist in the bodies themselves. So far, so good. Um, if you see a square thing, that perception of squareness really resembles the squareness of the object. If you see a round ball, your perception of the primary quality of roundness was caused by the roundness of the ball. So far, so good. But when it comes to secondary qualities, the ideas produced in us by these secondary qualities have no resemblance of them at all. There is nothing like our ideas of secondary qualities existing in the bodies themselves. So Locke is saying there is nothing like your idea of redness or of fragrance in a rose. There's nothing like your idea of sweetness that's actually in the chocolate. There's nothing like your idea of heat, which is in the fire. What? What? That's what he just argued. Now he wants to give you... Uh, a series of arguments here to prove this point to you because he knows that it's surprising. So um, I think these might illustrate his point better. So first of all, here's how I formalize his argument in section 16. If the secondary qualities of an object exactly resemble the ideas that it produces in us, then that would mean that the fire has qualities of both warmth and pain. Now, why does he say that? He says, look, when you get close to a fire, you feel the warmth, secondary quality, or you have an idea of the secondary quality. When you get a little bit closer, you have an idea of pain from the heat, right? Well, those are both pain and warmth. They're both ideas of secondary qualities produced in your mind by the fire. If, um, if those qualities are actually in the fire somehow, uh, then that would mean the fire has the quality of a pain. The pain is somehow in the fire. But that's crazy. The fire doesn't have the quality of pain. It's The pain is in you, not in the fire. Therefore, the secondary qualities of an object do not exactly resemble 
the ideas that it produces in us. Okay, next object. So let's say you eat something, let's call it manna, and it's got these qualities. It's sweet and it's white, but it also produces pain and sickness in you. He wants to say, look, all these qualities, which are all secondary qualities, are ideas produced in you by this food. If the pain and sickness produced by manna are not in the manna itself, then neither are the sweetness and the whiteness. But clearly, pain and sickness, which are produced by the manna, are not in the manna itself. Those are in you. Therefore, the sweetness and the whiteness are not in the manna itself. They're just in you, in your head. Here's another one along the same lines. If the qualities, if qualities really exist in an object, then that would mean, that means that they exist independently of our sensation of them. That is, if, 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 uh, if a quality really exists in an object, then it has that quality even if nobody's looking at it. Even if, so if a tree falls in the forest, it's got all the same properties whether anybody is there to see it or hear it or not. But, he wants to say, secondary qualities don't exist independently of our sensation of them. What, what is the sound of a tree falling in the forest if nobody's there to hear it? Well, you just got waves going through the air, but there's no sound until it hits an eardrum. And he wants to say, yeah, therefore, secondary qualities don't really exist in objects. Nothing like smell exists unless there's somebody's nose around to smell it. That's his point. It's in the nose. It's not in the object. Finally, let's say you got this rock or jewel, porphyry. I don't know what porphyry is, really. It's some kind of rock. And, um, you know, you put it in different light and the color changes because it's in different kinds of lighting and it refracts different ways. Well, he says, if the color of the porphyry is really in the object itself, then that means that the properties of the porphyry itself are changing whenever the light changes. But that seems wrong. It seems like the properties of porphyry do not change every time the lighting changes. Therefore, the color of porphyry is not in the object itself. So Locke's takeaway point here is colors, tastes, smells, feels, uh, those things are not in objects, secondary qualities like that. They're just in your head. The only thing that's in the object are things like shape and solidity and geometrical properties of motion uh, that impact other particles and cause certain ideas in your head. It's only the primary qualities which are really in the objects.